remain standing, we, uh, you're standing on the solid rock, right? So remain standing. If you're involved in the youth program, uh, please head on upstairs. The rest of us turn to Nehemiah chapter 5. In Nehemiah chapter 5, I want to read verses 14 and 15 for our text. And then we'll pray. If you have your Bibles, I would like for you to read along with me. Nehemiah chapter 5, starting in verse 14 and 15, and then we'll pray, and let's read that together. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the twentieth year even unto the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that is, twelve years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people, and had taken of them bread and wine, beside forty shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people, but so did not I, because of the fear of God. Let's pray. Lord, a great motivation behind our actions that would help us to, to keep our hearts right, to keep our motives straight, would be a fear of you. And Lord, as we read these verses, uh, we see Nehemiah, a man who is an honorable man. And that's something that I think we need to be. Lord, help me to preach this message. Take it and use it. Use it in our hearts. May our hearts be open and ready to receive. That we'll apply these things to our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And you may be seated. I think we all know what adversity is. If you think about adversity, you think about something that is often a very painful thing. It's a very painful teacher. Because in adversity, we often lose something that we value. Something that was important to us. Right or wrong, we wanted to keep it, but we lost it. Often, God brings adversity in order to take away something that shouldn't really be a part of our lives. So if you're going through adversity, it might be good to ask yourself the question, what is God showing me here? God uses adversity. He uses it to chip away from our character so that he can form us and make us more like Christ, so we could be Christ-like. In fact, the word Christian means to be like Christ. So if you consider yourself a Christian, that's the standard. We cannot reach it. So God often brings things into our lives to help us reach it. Now, up to this point in the book of Nehemiah, adversity and refinement through trials have been Nehemiah's experience. That's what he's gone through up to this point. But now things are changing. Now, I want to say this. If adversity has been difficult for you, and with everyone it usually is, Adversity can be difficult to handle. Prosperity is often more difficult to handle. Think about it. When do you cry out to God the most? When you're in trouble or when you're comfortable? When you're in trouble. Thomas Carlyle, who was a great Scottish historian in the 1800s, he said this. He said, for every 100 men who can handle adversity, there's only one who can handle prosperity. Now, I don't know where he got his statistics. I don't know who he talked to. And I don't know if it's really accurate. But he has a very good point. His point is very clear. And what is that? What's his point? His point is, when we achieve prosperity, then we begin to face the temptation to stop trusting in God and start looking at our own self-sufficiency to carry us through. The writer of Proverbs chapter 30 knew the danger of this, and he wrote this. I love these verses. Notice this. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. If you have your Bible, please follow along with me. Uh, it's good for you. It'll, it'll help you learn where things are, and it will help you to remember where the Scriptures are, okay? Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9, it says this. Two things have I required of thee, and he is talking to God, Two things have I required of thee, a big house and a fancy car. No, that's not what he's asking for. Deny me them not before I die. Starting in verse 8, 
Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or, lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. You see, he, he says, Lord, I don't want to be poor, because if I'm poor, I might be tempted to steal. But I don't want to be rich either, because if I'm rich, then I might, I might start leaning on myself, Lord. I might start living in my own strength, and I might deny you that way. So he says, I want to be in the middle. Just not rich or poor, just in the middle. It is a constant warning in Scripture not to trust in our own self-sufficiency because it's a big danger. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, the Bible says this. And Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, Timothy, I want you to tell this to your church. Timothy, I want you to say this to them. And so he writes this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. In other words, those who are rich have a tendency to be high-minded, to be proud of who they are. To be a bit arrogant about who they are. Uh, I had a high school teacher like that. The uh, first day of class, we're all sitting in there waiting to see who this new teacher is and what he's going to be like. And he goes up to the board, and at first he doesn't say anything. We're all sitting there, and he writes on the board, Dr. Finning. And he turned around and he said, you will not call me Mr. Finnick. You will call me Dr. Finnick. I went to school for many years and I spent a lot of money to become a doctor and you will call me doctor. <laughs> so for the rest of the year, it was Dr. Finney. Turned out to be a pretty nice guy, except he was a bit arrogant. Pridefulness, because he was a doctor. And he's not the only one. There are many people like that. Probably some people in our own church can be that way. Right? Because we have money, we think that somehow that means that we're more valuable. Money doesn't determine your value. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 4 and 5 says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 4 and 5. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency as a child of God, our sufficiency is of God. So everything that you have, God gave you. Everything that you are, God made you. We need to keep that in mind. So that nothing belongs to me, it's all His. Now, very few people, very few, there are some, but very few people can actually keep a spiritual and emotional balance in times of advancement. Psalm 75, verses 5 through 7. Psalm 75, verses 5 through 7. We, we need to keep this in mind. Because we need to understand that if we are higher up in life, we didn't get there on our own. Psalm 75, verses 5 through 7 says this. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion, military guys, this is a good word for you. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. It comes from the north. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. So the reality is that we have nothing to do with promotion. Now, every Christian ought to do his best. Because people are watching you. You shouldn't be a lazy person on the job or anywhere else. You ought to do your best. But you're not doing your best so that you can climb higher. You're doing your best to please God. You're doing your best because you serve the Lord. Every person ought to do their best. But we need to remember that when we are promoted, when we do make more money, or whatever happens in your life materialistically, God did it. All glory should go to Him. Remember that. If you become materialistically successful in this world, we are nothing more than recipients of God's blessings and God's grace and God's mercy. 
You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. No one deserves it. But God gives us His mercy and His grace. One of the biggest struggles that any human being ever faces is finances. Money. We struggle with it. We struggle with trying to make it. We struggle with trying to live with what we've got. We struggle with trying to remember it is not what makes us who we are. We struggle with money. Constantly. In our text we see Nehemiah. Nehemiah has achieved a certain level of advancement. He's gone from being a cupbearer to being a governor. A governor. That's like a mayor in the city, you know? He's somebody now. Incidentally, how many of you have met the mayor of Kunsan? Raise your hand. You have met the mayor of Kunsan. I met him once. I met him once. I know where he eats breakfast on Saturdays. I happen to be there on that particular Saturday. He ate there. He does that often. The restaurant told us he does that often. And I met him there. And this is, this is how it went. My wife and I were sitting at this table, and there's a bunch of Korean men sitting over there at that table. And my wife goes, I think that's the mayor. I said, that's the mayor. Wow. I looked over there. Which one? Because he didn't shine. He wasn't bigger than the rest. They all looked equally smart. They all looked equally ugly. I had no idea which one was the mayor, or handsome, depending upon your perspective. I had no idea. Why? Because outwardly, there's not much difference between us. <coughs> the reality is, there was nothing significant about him. But he was the mayor. The guy had responsibility. He had authority. He had privilege. He had things to do well above anything that I've done. He was somebody important, but he didn't act that way. He wasn't a prideful guy at all. He was a nice guy. I don't know where he stands in politics, but as a person, he seemed like a nice guy. Folks, listen. What you have does not determine who you are. It doesn't make, doesn't make any difference what you have. It is a very sad fact that there are so few Christians in places of authority, is it not? We would like to say that we have a Christian president in our country. We would like to say that all of the members of Congress, or for, for Korea, the, the Blue House, what do you call that, Parliament, or whatever, whatever you call it. Uh, all of those guys, we'd like to say that they're all Christians, but we know that they're not. In fact, we know that most of them aren't. Some of them could be, I don't know, I've not met them. I met the mayor, and we didn't talk about much. I said hello, he said hello, and he left. So uh, we didn't get down to brass tacks, I didn't get to ask him if he was safe, so I don't know. But we would like to, we wish, that we had more Christians in places of authority, don't we? Don't you wish that your boss was a Christian? If you have a boss that's a Christian, you're blessed. Most people don't have that. Don't you wish that? Why are there so few Christians in places of authority? I've got several thoughts. First of all, it, I, I think it's partly because fewer Christians are willing to make, to, to mold to society in order to get promoted up the ranks in business and society. Some Christians just don't want to compromise. They don't want to go there. They're not going to go out and party with the boss so that they can get promoted. So they don't. I think this is partly one reason. Another reason, partly because some Christians have learned the secret of contentment where they are. Amen. And because they're content where they are, they're not really trying to get ahead. They've learned to be content. That's not a bad thing. But then I think that there's so few people who can actually handle prosperity. And I think God looks down from heaven and he looks at me and he says, Jim, you could have been a billionaire, but if I gave you a billion dollars, you wouldn't be a very faithful Christian. Sometimes I think that that's also why it happens. You say, where's your biblical proof? Thank you for asking. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Notice this verse. Now, God will never tempt us above our ability to resist. Okay? Notice this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So in other words, God, if, if we're tempted, God gives us a, a way out. Alright? 
He never gives us more than we can handle. So what does this verse mean? Does it mean that there's a limit to the depths of our temptation? No, not necessarily. What it means is that there is no limit to God's ability to deliver. Whatever you're going through, God is big enough to handle it. And he'll give you an escape. God provides an open door of escape so that no temptation, no matter what it is, no temptation could ever trap us up or make us fall. So that if you fall, if you sin, it's not God's fault. God's provided a way for you to obey Him, for you to be blessed, for you to have victory. Therefore, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Our circumstances can never be an excuse. Never. No matter what you're going through, you could never look at God and say, I had to. He made me do it, or she made me do it. No, there is never an excuse for sin. Never. God's made a way to escape so that you can bear it. He's ensured that our circumstances are powerless. Our circumstances are powerless to force us to do what's against God's will. We can do what God wants. He's made a way to escape. It's there. All we got to do is take it. It's pretty simple. So, if in, a, in, in, in applying that to prosperity, if you cannot handle prosperity, it's not God's fault. It's yours. Because your circumstances didn't matter. When we were talking about the circumstances earlier, I said it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. You don't have to say and Everybody says amen. But now when it comes to the area of prosperity, God says I can't give you more money because you can't handle it. You won't take that door of escape. So for you, the door of escape is not to give you riches. Sometimes I think that's the way God thinks. Now, I don't know. We haven't sat down and talked about it a lot. But I think God can think that way in some cases. Our families, folks, our families, our churches, our society needs Christian leadership. As fathers and mothers, we need to be good Christian leaders for our children. How many of us want our children to grow up and punch out into the world? I am so tired of watching young men and women grow up in church and then leave. I'm tired of watching that, aren't you? I'm tired of being involved in youth programs or teen ministries or whatever and watching these kids, as soon as they get old enough to do what they want, legally, they do. And they punch out into the world and we wonder, what's going wrong? The youth today, they're so bad. No, their leaders didn't do a good job. We have an epidemic, an epidemic of young people leaving the church as soon as they can. Why? Part of the reason is because there hasn't been good enough leadership. We've not given them what they need. We need Christian leaders. I want you to notice some contrast here. Turn to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs 29, I want you to look at verse 2. Let's read that one first. Proverbs 29, verse 2. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2 says this. When the, when the righteous are in authority, the people... What? Rejoice. Let's try that again. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Mm. And that's so true. That's incredibly true. But it's only true if the people are righteous. When society gets so bad that they want wicked leadership, then they're happy that they have wicked leadership. So there comes a point, well, I like to call it the tipping point, where a society or a culture goes from being uh, a, a moral culture into an immoral culture, I think we're there. We've reached the tipping point. So this is only true if the people are righteous themselves, because the wicked certainly don't want a righteous ruler. So what happens then if the people are wicked? What happens when the people actually desire a wicked ruler? Well, here's the contrast. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 4. Remember Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But now look in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 4. Habakkuk is one of those little bitty books in the middle, you know? You got the 12 minor prophets. They weren't good enough to play major prophecy, I guess. I don't know. The minor prophets, because the books are smaller, Habakkuk is one of those smaller books. Find that. Find chapter 1. Look at verse 4. This is what it says. 
Therefore, the law is slacked. That's not a good thing. And judgment doth never go forth. That's not a good thing. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceeded. You know why sometimes our government makes bad laws? So yeah, because we're bad people, they make bad laws. All those liberals in there, they want this, they want that, it's all bad. You know how they got in there? We voted them in. We voted them in. As a society, we voted them in. So I didn't vote for them. Amen. Praise God for that. But somebody did. And there were more of them than there were of you. So that means the wicked have compassed about the righteous. And bad judgment has gone forth. We can't miss this principle. This is important for us to, to, to grasp. Why is it that our laws are being changed from good laws to bad laws? Because the wicked compass about the righteous. Why is it if the righteous were in authority, then the righteous could rejoice? But when the wicked are in authority, the righteous mourn. So what do we need to do? As believers, we need to pray that God is going to raise up for our nations some godly leadership in our nation that's going to help mold the value of our society. Some men who are just going to do what's right. Why? Because they'll get elected if they do it? No. Why? Because they're trying to appeal to a certain group? No. They're going to do right because it's right. That's what we need. And there are very, very few leaders like that. Here in Nehemiah, we've got Nehemiah doing right because it's right. Nehemiah accepted this position as governor. Has this, uh, this position for a while, but he takes it gracefully. He works diligently. He doesn't become prideful. If you can read down through the rest of the chapter, you'll find out that he never stopped working on the wall. He continued doing what he went there to do. Diligently seeking to make things better. To change from bad to good. Remember what happened in, earlier in chapter 5? He, he saw that you know, taxes are too high and people were, were taking out all these loans and everything. They couldn't pay off their bills. And he went to the rulers and said, what are you guys doing? You're killing us. You're killing the people. You've got to stop right now. And he put a stop to it. Nehemiah brought an end to it earlier on in chapter 5. He did that. He saw the corruption and he put a stop to it. Nehemiah, I don't think you could color him any other way. He was a godly leader. He was a good leader. Now, if you've got your bulletin, you can see there are three points here I want us to, to meditate on. Three points to ponder this morning. The first one is the selfless use of privileges. The selfless use of privileges. In verse 14, Moreover, from the time I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year even into the 20 and uh, the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king, that is 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of of the governor. He said, we have not eaten the bread of the governor. He was allowed to. That was his lot. It was kind of like his paycheck. He was allowed to do that if he needed, to, if he wanted to do that. But he felt that the people were not able to do that. They could not afford to do that, so he did not take it. In fact, if you read later on, he actually supported the whole government from his own house. Incredible guy. He had the privilege to do something but he wasn't going to abuse that privilege. Now, some of us are bosses, and we have certain privileges that come along with being the boss. You should never abuse your privilege. It has an effect on people around you. When promotion comes, privilege comes. A wise leader may use those privileges, but he's careful not to abuse those privileges. Now, when, when my kids were growing up and when, when they were younger, sometimes I'd tell them that they could or could not do something. I would say, you can't do that. Why? I don't want to get a long explanation with a five-year-old why it's dangerous to go out and play in the traffic, you know? What's going to happen to him if he continues to stick a chopstick into the wall outlet? Well, there's electricity in there. It's going to go flowing through the chopstick and turn your hair into a mess. Don't do that. So I don't want to go through all of that. I just want to make sure that my five-year-old or my three-year-old understood that daddy did not want them to do that. And so they would say, why? And I would say, because I say so. First and primary motive in your life, young man or young lady, is to obey your parents. 
You may or may not ever understand why. Maybe I'll tell you someday. Maybe I won't. But you need to understand what it means to obey. And I would tell them that. I wanted them to understand I was the boss and they were the children and they had to listen. It was for their good. Parents, some of us parents need to get a real grip on this because some of parents, their kids are the boss. I see it all the time. <clears throat> kids that run the house. You know, parents will come in, they'll sit down, they'll say, little Johnny doesn't want to do this or they don't want to do that. Well, who cares what they want their kids? You teach them what they need to do. You don't let them do what they want to do. Sometimes you do. I mean, if they want to do something and it's okay, that's fine. But, you know, they don't run the house. I have seen it time and again, and so have you. You go to the supermarket, and there they are, running up and down the aisles. I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. And if parents bought them everything they wanted, they would, they would be in debt. Because the desire of a child for candy or toys has no end. All right? It just, there's no bottom to that well. So at some point, you've got to teach them to listen to mom and dad. However, that doesn't mean that mom and dad, having this privilege of being mom and dad, gets to abuse the privilege. We don't get to do that either. The fastest way to cause a child to resent you or to hate you is to abuse your privileges. Now, Nehemiah doesn't do that. He doesn't take advantage of his position. He doesn't abuse his expense account. Paul does the same thing in the New Testament, by the way. He understood this principle. Though he was an apostle, though he could take certain liberties, he does not do that. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. And we'll just read 8 and 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Paul writes this, For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. We're leading, you follow. You know how you ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. So, so Paul said, we, we didn't come in there and demand that you feed us and take care of us. We didn't demand that you pamper us. We came in there and we worked alongside you. We worked hard and we did what we had to do because we wanted to be good examples to you. You want to be good examples to the people following you? Then you lead in righteousness. If you lead in righteousness... They, if they're going to follow you, must follow in righteousness. That's the way that principle kind of works. So Paul knew he has these privileges as an apostle. He could have demanded that the Thessalonian church provide for his needs. He could have demanded that because he was an apostle. But he felt that it was more beneficial for the gospel if he did not use those privileges at that time. You take a guy that's a CEO of some big company somewhere, all right? He's, he's a CEO. Maybe he's the CEO of Time Magazine or Korea Herald or anything. Just pick a big company. It doesn't matter. He's the CEO. He can come and go as he pleases. He does not answer to you. So if he decides to come in an hour after everyone else, he could do so. If he wants to go home two hours before, he can do so. If he decides to take every Friday off and go play golf, he can do that. He can do whatever he wants because he's the boss. However, typically speaking, the boss puts in more hours than the workers. If you've ever been a boss, you know the reality of that. You don't wave the flag and say, I'm putting in more hours than you. I'm working harder than you, but you do because you know that it's necessary to do certain things and you try to get those things done. So typically, a good CEO usually shows up at the company earlier than everyone else. There's something about Korean culture I've never been able to appreciate. The workers do not go home until after the boss does. Amen? Amen. This, that's Korean society, right? Amen? Amen. So, so what happens is the Korean workers are sitting around waiting for the boss to go home. He's still here. <laughs> go home. So, hey, you call him and tell him there's an emergency at home. <laughs> Let's get him out of here. Right? 
Tell him his car's on fire or something. You know? Get him out of here. Because right? they're waiting for the boss to go home because Korean workers are not going to go home before the boss. Now, in America, we work 9 to 5. That's what our contract says. And that's what we do. And the boss wants you to go home on time because you have to pay more money for overtime. We don't want to pay more money, so we want you to go home on time. It's a different culture. It's a little bit different. Different culture. And I understand that. But the reality is, the guy that's the boss may have great privilege, but if he abuses that privilege, his workers can see that too. They know. You can be sure that they'll follow suit. If that's the way you lead, that's the way they follow. What kind of Christian are you when you are abusing your privileges? Now, Nehemiah doesn't do that. He's got privilege, but he doesn't abuse it. Another thing that we see, another temptation that comes is the temptation with authority is the abuse of power, which is a little bit different than the abuse of privileges. This is something you can do, but you don't. But then there's the abuse of power. I am the boss, and you better do what I say. You go get the toothbrush, and go clean the toilet. Can't I, can't I use a scrub brush? No. Toothbrush. But boss, I got a better... No. It's my way. There is no highway option, right? Abuse of power. How many leaders act as if they are the lords in the lives of their workers? And there, there have been times in the past that, you know, where, where my wife and I have been tempted to do something like that at the lighthouse. Because of problems with workers, we've wanted to do something that would have been maybe a bit extreme. You know what I'm saying? A bit extreme. Like, Okay, so um, they have this problem with sleeping in class while they're teaching. Now, my current teachers are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. Great Christians. It's not them. I'm talking about years ago, okay? They go to class, give a writing assignment, put their feet up on the desk, and go to sleep. So my wife says, let's take all the chairs out of the classroom. They'll sleep standing up. They'll fall over and hit their heads. That'll teach them. I'm like, we can't do that. We can't do that. I want to. I have the power to take the chairs out of the classroom. But that would kind of be abuse of power. So we didn't do it. Some leaders, they will abuse their power. Another abuse of power is when a leader uses his ability to influence people in a way that will benefit him personally. So what kind of decisions do you make, father, for your home? Mother, for your home. What kind of decisions are you making? Are you making decisions that's going to help your family spiritually, or is it just good for you? Because that's a big threat. That is a big, big problem. It's easy to do what I want for me. But what's good for my family? What's good for everyone? Am I trying to influence them for their benefit, spiritually speaking, or mine only. Authority is given for the good of the organization, not for the good of the leader. We need to get a grasp on that. Authority is given to you, parents or bosses, for, for those who are under you, so that they have someone to lead them. Years ago, we had a, a house in, in America, and we wanted to put up a wall in the back. You know, so we went out and we bought the wood and stuff to put up the wall. I'd never done that before. No idea what to do. No clue. I went to church and I said, hey, I'm going to put up a wall behind my house on Saturday. Um, I'll buy the pizzas. Now you say that to a bunch of single young guys and you're going to have some workers. So what we did, we had lots of guys flocking in to help me put up this wall. But I didn't know how to put up a wall. I never put up a wall before. I was hoping they did. No, nobody knew what to do. So we were standing around talking about how we're going to do this. Well, let's see. Uh, we could do it now. No, maybe we, yeah, we're just. I mean, we wasted 45 minutes trying to figure out how to get started. And I was supposed to be the leader because it was my wall and my house and my pizza. So I'm the boss, right? But nobody knew what to do, and I couldn't help them. All of a sudden, this guy that was at church, you know, one of our church guys, he was a marine. <laughs> Apparently, marines build a lot of things. He shows up late because he worked late. Him and he drags a buddy with him, another Marine guy. They show up, they walk in the back, and they say, what's going on? Y'all ain't got started yet? No. And he took control. And that wall went up in no time at all. I mean, it was like an hour. We were done. 
We were in there kicking back eating pizza. Somebody had to be a leader. Folks, somebody has to be a spiritual leader in your home. Somebody has to be a spiritual leader on the job. Somebody has to do the leading. And if you will lead in righteousness, those that follow you will follow in righteousness. That's the way that principle works. Nehemiah knows he needs to be a good leader because he is setting, he is setting the pace for years to come. And he knows he has to get it off to a good start. So he's trying to use his authority correctly. That's why we need to keep some spiritual condition of a person that has to be kept in our minds. You don't vote for some guy just because he's going to make good policies for you. You vote for somebody that's spiritual. You say, but I'm not getting any options. Sometimes it's rough. You've got to pray about it and ask the Lord to help you. Sometimes we don't get, I mean, especially in America, you know? You've got the Republicans and the Democrats. Oh, yeah, there's those other guys too, but that's never going to happen, and we know that. So we typically look at the Republicans and the Democrats, and we go, man, you're just going to have to go with one of these two guys, and we're either going to get a loudmouth who can't stay off of Twitter and keep himself out of trouble, or we're going to get somebody else who, you know, doesn't mind, you know, aborting babies. That, for me, made the decision a little easier. You all see where I'm going here? Sometimes it's not easy. But you've got to decide based on spiritual principle. And some people will go, well, he, you know, he, he's going to get, he's going to, this, this guy, here's a good one. This guy's from Cholabukdo. If he becomes president, they're going to pump money into Cholabukdo. And we can build new roses and we can, build, we, we can do all of this great stuff in Cholabukdo. But where does he stand spiritually? What is his policy on moral issues? I don't know. Maybe you should find that out. You see, because that's what we need. When you vote, remember that what our society needs is a godly leader who is going to help the moral fabric of our nation. Everything else will come along with that. We don't want a leader who's only looking for self-promotion, uh, self if you will. When you choose a leader in any aspect, whether it's a president, uh, ladies, how many single ladies here? I'm single. Raise your hand. I am not married yet. Raise your hand. Single ladies. Look, you can either raise your hand or stand up. I want to see how many there are. There are, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, we got seven, six, seven, eight, I don't know. Anyway, you're, you're going to choose a leader, a husband. Right? You're going to choose a leader. Listen to me. Choose a spiritual leader. Don't choose a loser just because he's rich. All right? Don't choose a loser just because he's handsome. Or... He's kind to me. Don't choose that guy. Amen. You choose the godly one. Okay? He could be short, fat, and ugly, but if the Lord leads you, marry that guy. Just roll him home, you'll have fun, okay? Don't worry about it. It doesn't really matter. All of those other things are nice. But what you need is godliness. That's important in a leader. Let's look at the next thing. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 15. Selfless use of policy. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 15. But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people. Oh, did you see that? The guys before him, they weren't quite like him. And had taken of them bread and wine, beside forty shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people. But so did not I, because of the fear of God. All right, so that would be like, um, um, that's like, uh, okay, Kenny here. Kenny, he works at the lighthouse. Great teacher, love him to death. But Kenny walks in one day, and he, he looks at the secretary, and he says, um, you got to do this. Why? Uh, because I work for Jim. You know. Or the slave that goes downtown and starts telling the, the guy in the markets what to do. Why? Because he works for the governor. That's what, that's what was happening before. Nehemiah says, we don't work that way. That's not our policy. That's not the way we do business. Selfless use of of policy. Nehemiah dared to be different. You know the people the people respected that. They probably were very thankful for that. That Nehemiah was different. That Nehemiah didn't have servants that could go around throwing his name around and get what they want. He knew that the former leaders 
The former leaders had been abusing their privileges, and he decided he was going to put a stop to that. If he was going to stop them from doing bad things, he wasn't going to do bad things either. Remember the earlier part of chapter 5. He stopped them, and he wasn't going to do it either. He could have continued the tradition, kept on going on doing the same thing that was always done, and nobody would have questioned it. That's something that we face in the military all the time, you know? There's a certain way of doing things, and we do it that way, we do it, do it, do it, and then a new guy comes in. new guy comes in, and he says... We don't do it that way in my, my old base. We do it like this. Why do you do it this way? Because that's the way we do it. Why do you do it that way? Because we do. Well, why? Because. Kind of like a story about a, a young lady. She was teaching her daughter how to cook. And, and she took out a cooking pan. And she sat it down. And she took a ham. She set it down on the cooking pan. She cut off both ends of the ham. And then put it in the oven to cook it. And the daughter said, Mom, why do we do that? She said, I, I don't know. Grandma taught me that. Let me call Grandma and find out. So she calls and she calls Grandma and she says, Mom, why do we cut the ends of the ham off before we put it in, into the oven? And Mom says, well, because um, I did it because that way it would fit inside the pan. I don't know why you people still do it. See, sometimes we just kind of get in the flow of doing things, and we keep on doing it, and keep on doing it, and keep on doing it. And it's that way with sin, too, by the way. You start doing something, and you just keep on doing it, and keep on doing it, and keep on doing it. There comes a point when you have to stop. You've got to break the flow. A good leader will know if things have been going wrong before, he needs to put a stop to it now. Parents, listen to me. If you've allowed your kids to get involved in things that were wrong before, you've got to put a stop to it now. Not tomorrow, not next week, but now. You need to look at your own leadership and say, I have been a bad leader for these few years, and I need to do better. And they're not going to appreciate it, and they're not going to like it, and they're, they're going to say things either to you or behind your back. They're going to say, Mom and Dad are terrible people. They're ruining my life. They're destroying my fun. But you know that it's the godly thing to do and the right thing to do, and you have to do it, so do it. Unless you want to lose them. Unless you want to lose them. Because that's what's going to happen if you don't. If you don't do the spiritual thing for your families, you can be sure that you will lose them. Nehemiah dared to be different. He didn't continue with the tradition. And, you know, no one would have questioned him. But the proper fear of God, that's where we started this, the proper fear of God will drive you to do the right thing, to be fair and to be faithful. The proper fear of God. Nehemiah knew. He knew what the former policies were. He could have went, man, that's a great position. I slip into that position. I'm going to get this and this and this. And it's going to be good. This is going to be great. I'm going to get these, these things, you know, that come along with the job. But he doesn't abuse the privilege. He doesn't abuse the power. And he certainly doesn't abuse policies. He steps in. Former policies go out the window. He's not going to do that anymore. He refused to succumb to uh, peer pressure or what was going on or society. He's not going to do that. He's going to do what's right. We need to learn that. One of the first things a leader should do whenever he assumes a new leadership position is to examine the rules in light of biblical truth. And if something doesn't look right, you've got to get it changed. Here's a quote for you. Do not follow where the path may lead. But go instead where there is no path and leave a better trail. Think about that. Don't go where others have gone. Christian, don't do what others are doing. Make a new road. A better road. And you lead people to follow you. You know, we talk about witnessing all the time. But you know what witnessing is? Witnessing is you trying to lead somebody else to Christ. Because you lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That might be true. But most of us never lead anyone to Christ. We don't. We're not leading them to Christ. We're doing very little in leading. But that's what we're supposed to be doing when it comes to evangelism. Leading people to Christ. Let's look at this last point here. The selfless use of personnel. Again, at the end of verse 15... In the middle, actually, toward the end, he says, Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people, but so did not I because of the fear of God. You know what I want to do? I want to go ahead and keep reading because I want you to see what comes after this. Starting in verse 16, he says, Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall, neither bought we any land, 
and all my servants were gathered thither unto the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 of the Jews and rulers beside those that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us. So all the rulers gathered in his house. Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowls were prepared for me, and once in ten days stored of all sorts of wine. Yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor, because the bondage was heavy upon this people. You say, all those other things sounds pretty heavy. What are you talking about bread for? Because his point is, all of those people were under his charge. He took what he had, what he was getting paid, and he used it to take care of them. He was using what he had to help them. And then while he was helping them, he wasn't saying, oh, this guy's my servant. He doesn't have to work as hard as your people. You see, he wasn't selfish with his people. He was selfless. Nehemiah couldn't bring himself to abuse anyone. He loved them. So let me ask you this, especially parents. Do you love your children? Your parents say, well, I, I love them too much to spank them. According to the Bible, if you love your child, you will spank them. According to the book of Proverbs, it is a mark of a parent that does not love his children if he does not discipline his children. It's in the book. Read it. And if you're like me, sometimes weep, right? Read it and weep. If you love your child, you want what's best for them. And what's best for them is not a better education. Now, you should give them a good education. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm not saying keep your kids at home and make them dummies. I'm not saying that at all, okay? You, you, you could want education for your kids. That's a good thing. You, you want them to, to be financially capable and stable. That's a good thing. You need to teach them how to handle money. That's all good. But what you really need for them is for them to know the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior. For them to have a good idea what it means to follow God. They learn that from you. A lot of parents bring their kids to church and they drop them off and they go home. Because they've got other things going on and they don't have time for religion. But they drop their kids off and they give you a little, you know, devil. And they expect the church in one hour a week to fix what the family has broken all week long. It's not possible. You've got them all week long. You're the biggest influence in their life. You're going to be the one that's going to change them from bad to good. And by the way, nobody's born good. I think it's funny sometimes I hear people say, where did you learn that? Did you get that from your mother or your father? You know what? They always get it from the father. The sin nature goes through the man. So, you know, they're born sinners. They don't have to learn how to sin. They have to learn how to do good. And you have to teach them. So that means that you need to know what's good. And then you have to teach them what's good. What about this idea of selfless use of personnel? Nehemiah loved his people. He wasn't going to take from them. He wasn't going to hurt them. He wanted to help them. We speak of leadership styles in academic circles. There's all of these leadership things. I remember when I was in the Air Force, the big thing was Stephen Hovey, I think his name was. That name sound familiar to me? Stephen Hovey, Stephen Covey. And he had all of the, he had to watch these Stephen Covey tapes, you know, and you had to sit through hours and hours and hours of this guy sitting there telling you how to be a good boss. And I was like, huh, huh. can I just read Proverbs? It's better, right? Big focus on leadership. And there's leadership styles, you know. You can be a you can be a dictator if you want, or you can be laissez-faire, which means you just don't care, or you can, you know, you can do this, you can do that, and they teach you all this stuff, and then they say, find your leadership style, and go out there and be the leader that you should be. I agree with that. Find out who you are as a child of God, and you go out there and you lead them according to what you're supposed to be. As a child of God, that's how we lead. If you want people to find Jesus, you better leave some good footprints. Because they're going to be following you. So his job was not to pick a leadership style and do this or do that. That wasn't his job. I, I think it'd be, it would do us good to remember that with all of these definitions, the most fundamental fact is that a leader is selfless. He's leading...
for their benefit, not his own. So mom, dad, you, you don't want your, listen, you know, there's a lot of pressure in society for, for the kid to grow up and become doctors and lawyers. And in Korea, they call it the saws, right? The four saws. They've come to understand that one of those saws, moksa, really doesn't make much money. So now there's only three saws. Um, so, you know, you have to become a saw, right? A doctor or a, 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 yeah, a teacher or, a, or what's the other one? A professor, right? Paksa, uisa, or which one am I missing? Anyway, yeah, the teachers are going, we don't make money either. Anyway, you know, that's the idea. You've got to become a saw and then you're somebody. And so there's a lot of pressure in society, not just Korea, but in America too. We want our kids to grow up and become important. We, we want them to go to Harvard or Yale or, you know, one of those Ivy League schools. And, and we want all of this. And we want our kids to be, you know, somebody big in the world, in the world's eyes. We want them to be big. And there's a lot of pressure to do that. But listen to me, parent. If you come to the position where you have to make a decision between their spiritual well-being or their educational or financial well-being, you better go with spiritual. Because God's going to take care of the other part. That's not, that's not your business to mess with. You make them spiritual. That's your job. So for those parents that like to keep their kids out of church so that they can, t they can study for the test coming up next week, you're out of the will of God. You need to have your kids in church. What are you teaching them? You're teaching them that education is more important than God is. That's what you're teaching them. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. If you've got a problem with that, see me after the service. I'll explain it to you again, probably with the same words. And then you can go home and pray about it and make the right choice, okay? But listen, the most important thing for your family is spiritual. Send them off to Hogwarts. Great, amen. I got one. Send them. Send as many as you can. I love that. Great, amen. Amen. But don't think for a moment that education is going to help them succeed in life. True success is knowing God's will and doing it. And your job as a leader, as a husband, as a father, as a mother, as a boss, is to move your followers onto God's agenda. So how are you doing with that? And what are you doing to do that? To get them to do what God's will is for their life. How are you doing with that? I used to get so frustrated with Pastor Stewart. Because I'd go to him with a question. I'd say, Pastor, what about this or what about that? And he'd say, did you pray about it? I would be like, what do you mean did I pray about it? Did you pray about it? Well, no, no, no. Just give me the answer here. Show me in the book. You know, what's the number? Did you pray about it? Did you try to study it out for yourself? No? Well, we'll talk about it in a couple of days. He would not, he would not tell me what God's will for my life was. Parent. You need to help your child learn where God's will is. And you need to help your child learn to get in it. But you certainly can't define it for them. I'm glad that I didn't define God's will for my kids. I would have been sadly disappointed. Parents, ease up on yourself. Your kid doesn't have to be number one. Number one at school. Number two, number three, number four, that's okay. Yeah, I've heard of parents that a kid comes home with a 90 on his test. You got a 90! If I did the test, my, my mom was happy. If I just did the test, if I just went to school, if I passed, if I came home with a D, my mom and dad were like, you got a D? Great, hey, amen, you're passing. A couple more years, we'll have you out of the house. Amen. Yeah. You know, that was their process. That, and I know that we need to push our kids to do better. I understand that, and we should. We should want our kids to do their best, but do their best for what? Do their best for God. So if the best is a 90, praise God for that 90. Can't do that. Try it sometimes. It's really liberating. It'll make you feel really good. Encourage your people. So don't, don't forget that fundamental fact. Nehemiah's job, any leader's job, is to move people to God's agenda. To motivate people to do God's will. That's what we're supposed to be doing. His privilege... Nehemiah's privilege is to help people become better at what they do by helping them become better Christians. Because Christians are supposed to be the best workers. Maybe not in ability, but certainly in diligence and zeal. Right? Amen. Certainly in diligence and zeal. So here's the conclusion. He said, really, already? <laughs> 
What was the guiding factor in Nehemiah's life? What was the thing that moved him? What was it that kept him focused? It can all be wrapped up in those last few words in Nehemiah 5 and verse 15. So did not I because of the fear of God. Because of the fear of God. If there are any lessons that we can take away from this, here they are, very quickly. Number one, my accountability to God is my guide in life. My, account my accountability to God is my guide in life. That's important. Number two, adversity can mold me into Christ-likeness, but prosperity tests my resolve to stay selfless. Promotion can actually be a downfall and not an upturn. Number three, prosperity is a vehicle. It's just a tool in which we can better serve God, have a bigger effect on society, and be able to help others. How are you using the things that God has given you? Are you serving the Lord with it? Are you helping others with it? Are you bettering others with it? Are you using your position in life, your finances, your whatever it is, to do those things? Because that's why God gives it to you. He doesn't give it to you to waste it frivolously. The guy told me, he said, I got a little extra money, I don't mind playing with slot machines, gambling. So I gamble a little bit, I just do it for fun. I'm not wasting my money. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm having fun. You're wasting your money. If you're wasting your money on frivolous things, while your brother is in need, you're going to have a hard time convincing me, and I know you'll never convince the Lord that what you're doing is okay. Because that's not the way it's supposed to work. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Parents, I, I've really been preaching a lot to parents today. Because we don't have a lot of CEOs in here. So this has been mainly focused on parents and teachers and that sort of thing. But I want to ask you this question, and, and, I'm, and I'm serious, and I need you to be serious too. At this time, this is a time to be serious. It's not the time to start thinking about getting out of here or the time to think of anything else. I want you to think about what you've heard this morning. And ask yourself the question, am I the spiritual leader that I am supposed to be? If the answer to that, you could be a good spiritual leader, but if you know you could be a better one, then this is a time for you to make the resolve to do better, and then do it. So as the piano begins to play, if God has spoken to you, would you come pray about it? Influence. In one way or another, how are you influencing them? 